how um, this lesson has just been going along with so many things, with uh, different people in our church and just the church as a whole and with our nation as a whole and uh, the whole world system of everything that's going on in this day and time. So uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to pick up, we're on the third point. So I thought we'll get through this. We're almost toward the end of this lesson, and uh, we'll get through it quickly. But every time I think that, then we... Uh, uh, we don't finish, so I'm not going to say nothing. <laughs> but anyway, we pray the Lord would speak to our hearts. and uh, Slow or fast, I'm okay either one, going through whatever Lord's speed the Lord wants. Uh, but I do want the Lord to speak to us and help us uh, this morning. And so let's look in the scriptures. 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, verses 38 through 45. Okay, we're going to read that first this morning. And I'm going to ask Brother Roger. Uh, we are recording this morning on the, our main page, so... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Brother Roger use one of these microphones. And and then we also uh, probably won't be recording during our worship service today. So if anybody's tuning in today and want to know about our worship service, we probably won't uh, video it. But anyway, go ahead, uh, Brother Roger, with the scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 through 45. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with thee, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David, and the man that bare the shield went before them, before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, a ruddy, and of fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said unto David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David unto the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Amen. I appreciate you reading that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer once again. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this class this morning. Father, for these scriptures this morning. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to gain the application, Father, from this. Help us to gain, Lord, by the Spirit of God, the truths, Lord, that you want to place in our hearts. Lord, for right now and for tomorrow and ten years from now, however long you allow us to live in this world, Father, I pray, Lord, we'd gain these spiritual truths. Hide them in our hearts. And Lord, may we not forget them. And Father, I pray, Lord, and if we do, would you bring them quickly to our memories. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this third uh, point of this lesson two here uh, this morning is titled The Conflict and the Conquest. Well, we got just briefly started in it last week, uh, but there's always going to be conflict and there will always be conquest. There will be victory if we follow the Lord and, and follow His Word. Uh, a statement made here, and I highlighted this in, in, in this, it said, it is a wonderful thing to win a victory. And it is. I think I mentioned that last week. It's a wonderful. Nobody likes to lose. There's nobody rejoicing. I was, uh, I did tune in. I, 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 I really, I, I get where I despise the NFL anymore and uh, because of all their political junk. But anyway, uh, but I still tune in a little bit. I don't know who, who these guys even root for or who they used to root for or maybe don't. don't. But I tune in to the very end of the, the, the Tar Heels football game yesterday. And I was just listening. I didn't get to watch it. Got to listen to it on the radio through the Internet. And uh, anyway, come uh, down, and, and Boston College was getting ready to tie the game up against North Carolina. It was 24 to 22. They were going for a two-point conversion. Well, what they did, they, instead of uh, tying it up, they threw an interception, and the Carolina guy ran it all the way back for two points for their team. And uh, so then they tried an onside kick. There was just a few seconds left in the game. But anyway, and uh, the kick was... Uh, they scrambled, and evidently there was a lot of disagreement about who recovered the kick. The official said North Carolina did. 
But uh, so when the officials said that, uh, the announcer said the other team started taking their helmets off and throwing them on the ground. I mean, they were mad. You know why they did that? They knew that the game was over. They, they probably thought it was a bad call. I don't know on all the details. I said I didn't see it. Uh, but they knew they had lost. There was no rejoicing in losing. They were mad. They were upset. Okay. Uh, did you know you and I, we ought to be a little upset if we're losing because we are on the winning side and we're following Christ. We ought not be upset with, with somebody else. We ought not be upset with this people or that people or, the, or, or even society itself. Well, if we're losing, it's our own fault. Because we're, we're to follow Christ. We're to be, the Bible says for us to be overcomers, amen, to be victorious. Now, sometimes it feels like we, we lose the battle. But I'm going to say God has won the war. The victory was won at Calvary. Amen. And so, uh, again, it's a wonderful thing to win a victory, but we must keep in mind that there is no victory without conflict. Nobody ever wins unless there's, there's a battle to take place. And we talked about that, uh, again, as we, we left off, and I tried to squeeze that in last Sunday. Uh, but uh, don't, be, don't be discouraged when the battle comes. That's easy said, but hard to do sometimes. Don't be discouraged when the battle comes. Uh, last, uh, the middle of last week, I was talking to someone for uh, quite some while, and, and uh, they, they claimed to be a Christian. Uh, by, uh, if you would ask them that, they would say that they were saved if you asked them that. Um, but the decisions they're making in life is just totally, yeah, I know that's right, but I'm going to do this. That's not what a Christian is. A Christian's a follower, a disciple of Christ. And so uh, when I leave that conversation, I try to give the Word of God and, and try to help and point them in the right direction. And, and, and you feel like, I've lost the battle. But it's not my battle. That's the Lord's. What is my battle? My battle is to preach the Word of God. My battle is to be a witness before Christ. It doesn't matter how they receive it. Amen. If they reject it, that's on them. The battle is for us to stand true and to be faithful and give the Word of God in clear context and what the Word of God says and let the chips fall where they may. Too many times, I'm speaking for myself here, too many times I think I've lost the battle because somebody didn't receive uh, the truth. That's not, that ain't for me to do. But it's a hard lesson for me to learn over the years. And I believe it's hard on a lot of pastors. And uh, you guys travel. I don't know. How, I guess you get to travel a little bit. And I was hearing a little of the story. But, uh, but from, I'd say if you took a, a survey, most, most all pastors, one of the hardest things in ministry is to not take it personal or is to take it personal when they don't receive the truth and say, here's the medicine. Just take it. It'll help you. No, no, not me. And, and you feel bad. I don't think, I really don't think the doctors, if they give you the prescription, do they ever call you and say, hey, did you take the medicine? Did it help you? How many's ever gotten a phone call from a doctor? You know what? They're not worried whether you take it or not. Yeah. They, they're not. And so, Lord, help us, whether it's a preacher, whether it's an individual, no matter who you are, amen, we're all to be Christians, disciples, followers of Christ, witnesses of the word, of, of, of the gospel, of the grace of God. And as we give that gospel out, let's not feel like we lost the battle because they didn't take it. Okay? But again... Uh, every battle, there's a victory on the other side. Sometimes, um, I've seen sometimes uh, some teams win. They had the W in the column. of uh, They won, but the other team outplayed them by far. So who's keeping real record here? The Lord is. Even when, it's, even when it looks like you got a big L up there, we still win in Christ. We still win in Christ. We need to be encouraged. I, Yes, I heard that, Lord. Yeah. We need to be encouraged. We still win in Christ. Yeah. But preacher, it's everything has gone wrong. Can I say when you look at Christ, everything has gone right. All the wrong things in this world will be passed away one day, and every right thing in Christ will live for eternity. So we need to give our focus on him. Certainly, and I read this little part here, certainly Saul meant well when he offered his armor to David. Uh, but for David, the armor of Saul would not have worked, and David knew that right away. It just didn't fit. He had to use his own weapons. I said last week in closing, I said, uh, uh, we, we know when something don't work. 
we think, well, I'll, I'll do this. This will, this will help me. Uh, I'll, I'll get with uh, uh, so uh, The Spirit of God reveals that that's not drawing you closer to God. That's not going to help you win the battle. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> haven't we argued with God sometimes when the Lord says you need to be praying? Uh, but, but I'll go, and I remember this many times in my life. Well, I'll go vi- I need to go visit somebody. And I go visit them, and you have a good visit, but the Lord says, but that's not what I told you to do. See, the weapon that God wanted us to do was to pray. And so we need to use the weapons that God puts before us. David's weapons were his staff and were his shepherd's bag and were his shepherd's sling. And all was necessary, uh, all that was necessary for, uh, for the five smooth stones he had gathered from the brook, he had used uh, these before and found them uh, to be tried, to be tested, and to be true. It wasn't the first time David ever used a sling. The Word of God has been tried <laughs> over and over and over again. It's been tested, Brother Chris, over and over and over again. And it's been found true <laughs> over and over and over again. It's been so tried and so tested and been so true that men's been willing to lay their life down and give their life for this book and for the cause of Christ. That's how tried, true, and tested it is. Amen. I'm thankful. And you want to know why? Because it speaks from Genesis to Revelation of the rock of all ages. It speaks of the stone. Amen. Uh, the chief cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that it's, 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 it's what we need. And, and David here, when he again, when he took that, that stone, he took it before he ever knew the battle. I, I think I mentioned that last week. But he took the stone before he ever knew he'd even be fighting in the battle. When he went by that brook, he didn't know about the giant Goliath. He didn't know those things. He, he took those things and, uh, uh, and he used that. You're going to be taken from the Word of God long before you fight the battle. He took many stones uh, throughout the years. He didn't know what he was going to be fighting. Amen. He didn't even get to sling a stone with that bear. And the Bible says he killed it with his own hands and the lion. Now, you're going to be fighting different battles and using different tools. Uh, but I guarantee you, uh, God will give you what you need to fight the battle with. One of the great problems in uh, Christendom today is the attempt to use weapons that are not tried and tested. Many of these uh, means and methods are being used today that are not those that God has chosen and approved. And they are directed at pleasing man and not God. That's what the direction is. Please man and not God. The ear tickling, uh, uh, having a desire to have the teachers uh, uh, tickle their ears instead of preachers that have preached the word of God. And uh, what is that? Uh, and I, I brought that book and now it's eluded me. Here it is. Uh, here's you a good book. If you've not read this yet, The Octopus of Humanism. Uh, Brother Jeff Farnham, he'll be with us again uh, in November. And uh, But, you know, you can figure it. Man's idea is, uh, I, can, I can figure out what I need. I can figure out how to fight the battle. Yeah, go ahead and think you can do it your way. Go ahead and put hum, hum, uh, your human mind above the mind of God. It won't work. You'll fail every time. All the, all the whole nation of the army of Israel, they were with it. We don't know what to do. We're just sitting back, letting a, a heathen giant defy their God, the same God that delivered them from the nation of, of Egypt and brought them out and delivered them time and time again. And they sat back and they forgot who their God was. And then a little boy shows up and, and says, is there not a cause? And so and this little boy, he didn't have humanism in him. He had a big God in him. Amen. And he knew that God could do it. Okay, But all those others, they was adapting to humanism. Well, I just... They were trying to figure it out, figure it out within themselves. I like uh, Brother, and I probably misquote him, but Brother Dean McNeese says, you, you can't figure uh, God out, you have to figure him in. Amen. You let God work through you. Let him speak to your heart uh, through the word of God. And let God be true. He's already been tried and tested in his word. And so I'm thankful for that. Uh, now picture the scene of an armed and... Uh, an armored giant over nine feet tall, accompanied by his armor bearer, advancing on a teenage boy who had no armor, no shield, and seemingly inadequate weaponry. Saul had told David, Thou art but a youth. But David's confidence was in the right place. His confidence wasn't in himself. If God was for him, who could be against David? 
we, we know that scripture, uh, uh, Romans 8, 31, and uh, I seen it on somebody's, uh, I went up somebody's doorstep the other day, and I looked, and I was just waiting there, I knocked at the door, and, and I, was, I seen that verse, Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? It's a good verse to have <laughs> on your doorstep. If God be for us, who can be against us? David knew that, amen. But David's confidence was in the right place. I had mentioned earlier, uh, I think it was uh, maybe last week, I don't remember uh, when I said it, but uh, I heard a young boy say a few weeks ago and uh, said, well, and I forget what the whole conversation, what it was about, but he, he was applying this scripture to David. He said, well, if David could, uh, could do it, I could do this. And I was like, well, that's not really what David's confidence or what his, his mentality was. David wasn't saying, uh, because somebody did it, I can do it. David was saying, because God is God, it can be done. Amen. That's what David was saying. And uh, uh, that's what we need to be saying. If God's God, then uh, we can do whatever he wants us to do. Well, preacher, you just don't know me. <laughs> no, but God does. And if God saved you and he's called you and he's, he's, he's shaping your life, then let God work on you. Uh, I, I'm reminded of uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6. Uh, he says, but being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. The problem with us is we quit allowing uh, God, we, we say, God, just quit working on me. I'm happy the way I am. I don't, want, need to, I don't need any more grace. I don't need any more mercy. I don't need any, I don't need any more anything. I, but we do need the mercy and the grace of God. Amen. It was the mercy and the grace of God that, that allowed David to defeat that giant. It was God's mercy. Did Israel deserve a giant to die? Did they? They were all fr afraid and, and moved with fear. They didn't deserve, I mean, they probably deserved to uh, let that Philistine go over there and, and, and whoop them, amen. Uh, but God had mercy and grace because one young boy uh, believed God. And so may we believe God that others might find mercy and grace. As David, uh, again, knew his weapons, we also need to know our weapon, and it is the weapon of the Word of God that our Lord Jesus Christ used to combat Satan after his time of fasting in Matthew 4 and Luke chapter number 4 as well. Uh, this uh, person I was talking to this week, uh, interesting about Matthew 4 here is, in Matthew 4, Jesus said, it is what, church? When he's combating Satan. He said, it is written. Yes, it is written. He, he referred back to the Word of God. Somebody said finish, but that's a good one too. Amen. And Jesus did <laughs> it. is finished. And uh, to tell us that, amen, it, it's finished. He did finish the work there on the cross, what he came to do. But he was speaking to Jesus there in Matthew 4. Uh, Jesus was speaking to Satan. He said, it is written. It's very important that we know what the Word of God says in the context it says that it's in, okay? And then Satan come back, and he's thinking, oh, Jesus wanted to use the Bible. Well, I'll just use the Bible too. And so he used scripture in Matthew 4. Satan used scripture against, with Jesus, trying to get him to do something, uh, to follow Satan's will. And Jesus come back and he said, it is written, what's the next word? Again. So what Jesus was showing us by leaving it in the scriptures or putting it in the canon of scriptures for us, he was showing us that yes, the, even the devil may use the Bible, but you better make sure it don't contradict another scripture in the Bible. In its rightful place, okay? You better and you know who it's speaking to. Is it speaking to the Jews? Is it speaking to the Christian? Uh, speaking to the church? I mean, who is who's it speaking to? I mean, don't take it out of context. Uh, you've all heard the uh, the uh, somebody said, "Well, give me some scriptures out of the Bible," and somebody said, "Well, Judas went and hung himself. Give me another scripture. Go and do thou likewise." See, you can take the Bible out of context, and it, it sounds pretty bad. But that's how bad it sounds. And so this one person I was talking to this week, uh, they said, uh, and, and I may deal with this uh, during our 11 o'clock service, and, uh, but uh, they were saying, well, the Bible says for him to know what to do good and do it not to him is sin. I thought, yeah, that's, that's a good scripture. And, but the way he was applying it was not being applied in the right way. That doesn't give you an excuse not to make the right choice in life. 
Did you know there's only two perfect choices? That's Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Anything else perfect in this world? Nothing's perfect, is there? What if, what if I left today and thought, well, we've got to get a pastor. You know what? You're going to have to, you're going to, have to choose a pastor. Is there another perfect? Is there, is, there, I say another, is there a perfect pastor? No, there's not a perfect pastor. So you're going to choose on somebody that's imperfect. Okay? You go to the grocery store. You have, do you not look through your vegetables before you buy them? I seen it was cauliflower. It was 50 cents a head yesterday. I was like, oh, that's really good. I looked in there and I grabbed it. I was like, oh, I see why it's 50 cents a head. Okay, and I put it back. It wasn't worth 50 cents. Amen. Uh, but anyway, I mean, to my chick. Well, I don't have chickens no more. Anyway, the chickens would have liked it. <laughs> but, but every choice in life is a choice. That doesn't mean God doesn't want you to make choices. You're going to have to choose sometime the best of two. Which one's the best? Don't take, well, God says, um, and use that verse and try to say, well, there's no perfect choice and there's no, you know, perfect or great good choice, so I just, I'm not going to choose. That's hogwash. That's the devil that's fed you something. Well, I'm not, this, and it's, here's the same scenario, and I've not heard this uh, as far as anybody around here, I guess, but, but somebody said, well, I'm just not going to church anymore. Why not? Well, there's too many hypocrites there. Or it's just not a perfect church. Really? There's never going to be a perfect church, is there? I mean, when we get to heaven, I understand the glorified body, but I'm talking about down here, there's no, we're made up of people that fail and people that sin and people that come short. There's nothing perfect, but you still have to choose. Does that mean God don't want people to go to church anymore? Of course not. He wants people to get in, into the local church. He wants them to get them to serve the Lord. By the way, and if you're trying to serve the Lord outside the local church, I, I, I just don't see that in Scripture. I mean, I know you can serve the Lord anywhere at any time, but the desire of God is to be working through a local New Testament church. We encourage one another. By the way, uh, by attending church, you're giving, you've been giving, uh, given uh, the, the duty of encouraging and exhorting one another. That's placed on you. I believe that every born-again Christian that attends a local New Testament church that will give an account on our work sake, work sake to the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ of how we encourage others at the local New Testament church. We'll say, well, you know, the church, everything rises, falls on leadership, and it does. I understand that. And say, well, you know, we just had a, had a bad service today. The preacher didn't even encourage me. Really? Well, how, did you encourage the preacher? The shoe fits on both ways, amen? And, and uh, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying uh, the battle is before us, and the Word of God is being given to us, but we shouldn't try to twist it to, to suit us for, for just stepping back. Well, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to make a choice. I don't have to do anything because there's nothing perfect in this world, so I'm just going to get out of the battle. Mm, that's not what the Bible teaches us. It, wasn't a, it was not a perfect army that David went. He went to see his brother because daddy, his daddy Jesse told him to do so and took the cheese and the corn to them and see how they fared. And that's the only reason he was there. It wasn't a perfect army. It's not a perfect nation, Israel. But God allowed David to go and fight against that giant. Don't, we don't need to give up because things aren't perfect. We keep in the battle because he's perfect. Amen. And he's asked us to do that. Let's go on here. Look in, let's look at the verse of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, 12. While you're turning, I'm going to read this little uh, last paragraph here, here. It says, It is a great challenge to a Christian to be familiar with our weapon, the sword of the Word of God. The Bible says about itself that it's quick, it means it's alive, that it's powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. So let's read that verse, Hebrews 4, 12. Roger, you still got, you want to read that? If you still got that microphone, I'll let you read. Give me a break today. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even unto the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow 
and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen. You want to know how your heart's doing? Just read the Bible. God will reveal it to you. Uh, you know that same individual that I talked to this past week uh, that was trying to take a verse out of context? I, I just asked, and surprised that they were honest. I said, have you been reading your Bible any in a while? No. The Bible will reveal our heart to us. It will reveal where we stand with God. That is, if you're honest and you want to know. Amen. It is a lot. It's a book that's alive. When the word when it says, "For the word of God is quick," it means it's a living book. Therefore, Jesus could have, and why he did say there in Matthew twenty-four thirty-five, I believe it is, "Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away," because it's alive. It'll be alive as long as God is alive. Somebody tell me how long God's going to be alive. Omega Alpha, he's the Alpha and Omega, isn't he? Amen. It's going to be a lot. It's a living book. It's a powerful book. Um, the reason I, I suffer in many of my battles is because I'm not in the book like I should be into. The reason I suffer is because I'm not in the weapon of prayer as I ought to be in the weapon of prayer time. Amen. And that goes for all of us. We need the Word of God and we need prayer. And so uh, we need to move on here a little bit. It says, we must also remember that Satan will twist the word of God as he did. And I already mentioned this, but as he did in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. Uh, when I was over in the uh, uh, Furnace County Jail the other day, we uh, somehow got on that uh, part, how the, he twists the word of God. And again, Jesus, during the temptation in the wilderness, Matthew 4 and Luke 4, making a vital that we have a deep understanding of the word of God. And so those men I just mentioned, they had brought up some questions, and I, I told them, I said, listen, I said, ask any question you want to say. There's no question off the chart. Ask anything you want to ask. I said, I have learned that if you ask questions and you're sincere about those questions, that uh, God will help you and he'll lead us. I said, I don't know everything. I said, I don't want to, I don't want to come across that way. Uh, but the word of God will teach us everything that we need to know. And they did ask questions. I started off in John chapter number 4, and I talked about how Jesus uh, met the woman at the well and had a desire to go there and, and all the things that was in her life. Did you know she asked questions of the Lord? She asked questions because she asked questions. Amen. The Lord revealed himself to her. You go ahead and ask questions of God. If we're, not, if we're not willing enough to ask a question, then God's not going to take time to, uh, to give us the answer without us seeking him. I do find in the Bible, Jesus said, seek him. Seek, ask, knock. Then he says, and it shall be given you. Amen. Sometimes we get out of order. We think, well, God will just give it to me anyway. Mm. All right. Let's go back to the humanism. Yep, God, you listen to me. I'm God and you're not. That's the attitude. But if we seek and we ask and we knock, God says, it shall be given him. And so, uh, anyway, those men began to ask and some questions and different things. And, and we've got men and different people uh, that's been here in the church and, and that still are here and, and whatnot that's saved out of Catholicism. Catholicism was a question that got brought up. We didn't get into it deep. But, uh, but again, uh, yea, hath God said? Where does everything uh, lie upon? It lies upon what God did say. And Satan has a great desire to twist and to change what God has already said. Um, God's word is a weapon that uh, has the power to change uh, people's eternal and daily life. Thank God for that, amen. I'm glad he didn't just save me, Brother, Brother Dibbon, eternally. <laughs> but his, his, the salvation is even helping us on a daily basis. What if all he did was just save you eternally? And no, no change took place. No growth took place within you. Does anybody ever want to see Christ in an individual like that? No, he wants to work on us on a daily basis. Psalm, Psalm 1, verse number 2, I'll read this to you. Uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Amen. God's given us a, a phone uh, in these day and times that we can have the word of God. Just, just a few clicks, and right there is the Bible. With the Word of God. And I mean, it's good. I, I love this book. Amen. I love the written Word. I, I don't like, some preachers are different. They can preach out of different uh, things. That's fine. But I like, I like the Word of God. Amen. Uh, but I'm thankful. I, wherever I have my phone, I can, 
I can be on an airplane tomorrow. I can be listening to it. I can be reading it right there um, and wherever you go. And so use your phone. Phones should be used more for the Word of God than Facebook. Phones should be used more for the Word of God than uh, Instagram, all the other things of social media. But use the Word of God uh, again. But His delight, there's a key on that verse, His delight. Hmm. I was thinking desserts right now, sorry. <laughs> uh, everybody delights. In the, we, I call them Carolina delights. Okay, you probably didn't, don't know what I'm talking about. But people call them no-baked cookies. Uh, the, the peanut butter and the cocoa and the oatmeal. And, and uh, uh, if they're made just right. Anyway, I just grew up. And we always at our house, we called them Carolina delights. I come out here and I was like, Carolina, I said, what are you talking about? And I, and I was like, oh, yeah, the no-baked cookies. I said, what's that? <laughs> that's, well, that's Carolina delights. Nobody listened to me. But <clears throat> I always delighted in those cookies. Amen. And I seen some, oh, we was down at Manhattan, Brother Henderson's meeting last month, and somebody made some down there, and I ate them. They were, them was good. But here the, the scripture said, our delight's not in desserts. Our delight's not in uh, the things. This world. Our delight's in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And God calls us to share his word with the world, Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So if we're delighting in this book, it'll be our joy to tell somebody else. Amen. All right, let, let me share this illustration with you. Man, this, this thrilled my soul uh, when I read this a few weeks ago. A missionary in Zimbabwe was passing out New Testaments in town. One man insisted that if he took the New Testament, uh, he would use its pages to roll cigarettes. The missionary agreed to give it to him under one condition, that he would read each page before rolling and smoking it. Almost two decades, almost 20 years later, the missionary again crossed paths with this cigarette roller. But this time, the man was giving his testimony at a Christian meeting. He told about the missionary who had given him a New Testament under, under the condition that he would read each page before he smoked it. After I smoked Matthew, and after I smoked Mark, and after I smoked Luke, I started in the book of John. And when I got to verse 16... Of chapter 3, I got saved. Now I'm a full-time evangelist. And can you know that you know how that thrilled that preacher's heart? I, I, the story stopped there, but can you imagine how it thrilled that, that preacher's heart 20, almost 20 years later to know, amen, you see what I'm saying? Some of us could say, well, if you're just going to smoke it, I'm not giving it to you. Amen. We need to trust God with some of our battles. Hey, if you'll, if you'll read it before you smoke, it'd be worse somebody reading it one time and, and then lighting it on fire. I'd rather them read it one time and light it on fire than never reading it at all or me just keeping it for myself. Amen. Amen. I was a joy to, uh, to give those Bibles to those, those prisoners this week because I knew they had a desire to read the Word of God. Amen. It's a desire. It's a great encouragement when somebody has it there. But what about if somebody don't? We still got to keep going and giving it, amen. We still got to keep going. Oh, I thought we'd get through with this. Let's see, letter B here. Well, David gave God the glory and the conquest. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, back in your Bible, verses 46 and 47. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine hand from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and that, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. We see David giving God the glory. He, all he had a desire was that the world would know who the true and living God was. And then so in uh, verse 47, And all this assembly shall uh, know that the Lord saveth not with sword, not with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David wanted the world to know, hey, it wasn't a spear, it wasn't a sword, it was the power of God. Right? And he was giving God the glory. One of the most powerful phrases in all the passages of Scripture is David's statement to Goliath when he says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Uh, what David did at this time and place, he did because he knew that there was a cause and because he wanted everyone everywhere to know uh, who the real champion was. David's proclamation that the battle is the Lord's is as true today as it was back then. 
Amen. What do you do? Why do you do what you do? Amen. Do we do it for the glory of God? And so David did exactly what he did this day when he faced Goliath because he wanted God's glory to be seen. Uh, whether I preach, amen, I'm not preaching for myself, I promise you that. Amen. I, I, it makes me, uh, I, when I go back and I, I, don't, I can hardly ever even watch five little minutes of, of a message, I was like, oh, did I say, why didn't I say it different? I'm so critical of myself, amen. And I know that's a problem I have to get over. But anyway, but, but you understand, I'm not doing it for myself. I don't want to do it for my glory. If I'm preaching for me, the, the, the benefits are nothing. The results are nothing. Amen. If, if, if we sing, if we're singing as a congregation, or we're singing as a special, or whatever we're singing as, guess what we're singing for? The glory of God. Amen. We're singing about His glory. Uh, whether we sing, whether we preach, why, why would we tell other people about Jesus Christ? For the glory of God. When you're praying for somebody to be saved, and that's a great thing to pray for somebody to be saved, but why would you pray that somebody be saved? For the glory of God. Because if that person gets saved, guess what they're going to do? They're going to give God the glory. Say, God, would you, would you, would you save uh, so-and-so? Would you save them? Uh, not just so they miss uh, hell, not just so they get to spend eternity in heaven, but would you save them that you would get the glory for it? May that be the heart and the centerpiece of everything we do, that God gets the glory for it. Uh, a lot of people, uh, they quit on God because they don't get enough glory. I remember, I remember a, a guy that I used to work with back in, in, in Carolina back in the mm, uh, early 2000s, uh, 2000, 2001, two, right in there, and, and they quit a good Bible preaching church. I'm talking about a good pastor. I'm talking about a good church, amen, a mission minded church. They, they, they quit all of that. You want to know why? Because their, their girl, uh, they felt like she didn't get enough singing to sing specials. And they went to a, a and I'm just saying it, they went to a contemporary, liberal um, church that didn't stand on the Word of God. And then they, they're, I, I catch a glimpse of here and there, and then it's, it's all right for them to sing country all of a sudden. Who's getting the glory? It's God. If it's God, then... In, if it's God, then we'll win. That's all he desires, to let him get the glory. Who gives preeminence? I think the Apostle Paul talked that, about that pretty clearly in the book of Colossians, chapter number 1. Jesus Christ, he's the preeminent one. May he get all the preeminence. It's not about us. I know several of you wanting to do some things in, in the church as, as a whole, uh, as far as for pastor appreciation much. I, I thank you for, uh, for doing that, I, and I... I respect that out of the office of, of, of the pastor, uh, but God gets the glory out of that. If you do that, please don't think, well, I'm doing this for pastor. Do it for God, the glory of God. If you do it for pastor, the pastor will let you down, then you'll feel bad for doing it. <laughs> well, I just, I can't believe I just did this for pastor. Then he stepped on my toes. I wasn't, I wasn't aiming at your toes. Amen. Uh, God was aiming at your heart. But do you understand, if you do it for the glory of God, then... Let it fall or it may. I remember as a, as a, as a young boy, I, I don't remember, I, hadn't, I don't think I'd graduated school yet, uh, uh, but anyway, somehow I had a $100 bill in my hand at, at a time. And this missionary, he's dead and gone on. And, and uh, after service, God said, give that to him. And I was out in the parking lot, and I handed it to him. Well, it wasn't long that that missionary's wife left him while he was on the field with somebody in, in that area, and she left him. And it ruined and devastated his ministry. Did I ever regret giving him that $100 bill as a teenage, young teenage boy? Did I ever regret that? No, because that's what God said to do at that time. I wasn't doing it for the missionary. I was doing it because of God. And if you do and you serve God because of the glory of God, you won't have to regret it later. Well, you say, well, I'll just leave it at that. I mean, all right, let me, I'll try to stick to this book so I don't run too many rabbit trails here. Uh, but God is, God is good. Just do it for his glory. Um, with that, David ran to meet the advancing Philistine and unleashed one stone from his sling. God guided that stone to the perfect place in Goliath's unguarded forehead, and the giant fell at David's feet. Instead of beating his chest and proclaiming his own skill and might, David gave God the glory for the victory. Amen. 
As Christians, we need to make sure that we are giving God the glory for all that He does. The credit for souls being saved does not belong to us. The credit for our talent does not belong to us. And As the battle is the Lord's, so is the victory and the praise. And Jesus reminded His disciples of this truth in John 15 verse 5 when He says, For without me ye can do what, church? Nothing. Amen. Uh, David understood that when he stated in Psalm 118, verse 23, uh, this is the Lord's doing, and it, it is marvelous in our eyes. And, uh, just as David gave God the glory for slaying the, his giant, we must deflect any praise we receive for God's blessing and deflect it back to God. Amen. In conclusion, 1 Samuel 17 begins with Goliath holding his head high in pride and blasphemy. Uh, but the chapter ends with his head uh, punctured by a relatively small stone separated by his own sword from his uh, huge body and held in David's victorious hand. I, I, st I still want to find that time machine and go back there when David holds that head up by that. Uh, mm. Anyway, this familiar story ought to remind us that we still have a cause and that through God we can have both courage and conquest in our present battles. Even today we must find our strength in the Lord and use the armor and weapons He has provided uh, for us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. I'll leave you with these verses. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I have no power myself. Oh, I don't have no strength in myself. I, I, I would stumble and fail. I would, I would fall like a, um, like a man with no muscles and, and just fall to a blob of jelly, spiritually speaking. Amen. Uh, but it's His power and it's His might. Verse 11 of Ephesians 6, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Those devils, he has those wicked wiles, those wicked plans, those wicked tricks he's, he's laid in store for all of us. And so we need to be ready uh, to face the battle and dare to take on the giants. And so this was the, the lesson for uh, taking on the giants. And uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll get into uh, dare to serve the king, how David and Saul, and we'll get into that and, and the battles that he had with, and with there. Just because the giant was defeated... You would have thought, boy, David's got it made now. When you face and beat one giant, did you know the next battle is probably going to be harder? Sometimes it's not the Philistine giant. Sometimes it's your own king in your life that could be the battle. Isaiah found that out. Found out sometimes kings are pastors in people's eyes. Sometimes, sometimes kings are daddies. Sometimes kings are mamas. Sometimes kings are grandmas and grandpas. Sometimes kings are churches. Sometimes kings are jobs. Sometimes kings are many different things. But you're going to face kings in your life. And it's not the worldly kings that you submit to. It's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. So looking forward to getting into uh, that lesson. And uh, <clears throat> before we dismiss in prayer, maybe you've got a comment you want to add to or maybe you want to take away if I said something wrong. <laughs> My wife usually tells me that, but she's in Sunday school class this morning teaching. But... <laughs> But any comment this morning? Anybody want to add to or, or take away? All right. Well, I appreciate you being here this morning.